right, we want to welcome everybody this morning. I'm sure there'll still be some others coming on in. My name is Danny Fitzgerald. I'm Acting Regional Director for the San Diego and Imperial Small Business Development Center Network. Uh, we are funded by the U.S. Small Business Administration and the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development. And uh, we're tasked with uh, helping small businesses, uh, you know, everything from idea where you just kind of come up with an idea all the way through your the entire life of your business, um, helping folks grow in particular, accessing capital. And of course, during, uh, during the pandemic times, we've been very busy helping small businesses uh, try and survive. And we know that that is uh, quite the battle and, and has been very difficult. We, we certainly understand and appreciate the, the difficultness, difficulties that small businesses have had. Um, but we also want to continue the conversations uh, beyond just the disaster, re disaster relief and, and those types of conversations. And so we're continuing this connect, Connecting with Capital series, um, which is something we've had for, for about four years now, where we bring in uh, lenders to kind of talk about how, what they do, give you some general familiarity with uh, the, the, the lending marketplace. And we can also talk about what Small Business Development Center does. Uh, the, these, you know, these events, we really appreciate them. They are sponsored, of course, by uh, Home Street Bank, Main Street Launch, CDC Small Business Finance, Marble Bridge Funding Group, and Primary Funding. And uh, we, we appreciate that. That's what allows us to continue to do because these are the types of services that we provide at no cost. Of course, the Small Business Development Center, that's really our main thing that we do is we have a, a fantastic team of advisors. We have uh, Jim Kelly that's going to be on the panel today. He is a, 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 an expert finance advisor assisting lenders uh, and uh, borrowers to be able to connect, helping mainly the borrowers to be able to complete the applications that they need um, and knowing what the banks really need to see and make, make basically their job much easier. On, on our panel as well today from, from lenders that we certainly, we have uh, Janelle Shalou uh, from Chase Bank. We have Jade Olin from Banner Bank. We have uh, Fred Crispin from United Midwest Savings, and we have Tom Becker from Wells Fargo Bank. And we had one other, but he wasn't able to make it. Unfortunately, we didn't have um, uh, the, our representative from Home Street Bank this morning. I, I know that they had, uh, had some potential conflicts this morning. If, if Gabriel gets in, we'll, we'll introduce him as well. Um, so really want to kind of start out by letting each of the lenders kind of introduce themselves, uh, the organization you work with, and, uh, you know, and those basic types of things for, for that. And we'll go ahead and start. Uh, we'll start with Fred this morning. So I got you on mute, Fred. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name's Fred Crispin. I'm with United Midwest Savings Bank. Uh, I, along with my son, run the small loan division for the bank on a nationwide basis. The bank's headquartered in Columbus, Ohio. We run the small loan division for the bank nationally out of Panama City Beach, Florida, providing working capital for startup and existing businesses uh, from 20000 up to 150000 under the SBA 7A loan program. Awesome. And then uh, Jade. Or <laughs> Good morning, everybody. My name is Jade Olin. I am the branch manager here at Banner Bank in Escondido, San Diego. And um, if you haven't heard of Banner Bank before, we are located in four states, Washington, Oregon, California, and Idaho. And um, you know, we, we do everything that the big banks do, you know, as far as from a London perspective. And, um, but I like to say we do it with more of a human feel. So sorry, big banks out there, but <laughs> so that's just a little bit about us. <laughs> awesome. And Janelle. Hi, I'm Janelle Shalou. I'm with Chase Bank. Um, you know, Chase Bank is a pretty, one of the biggest banks in the country. Uh, we work with all types of businesses. The, the, the smallest loan that we'll do is 10,000. We can go up to, uh, within my group, 5 million. We do have uh, higher levels within the bank. We can go up to whatever you qualify for based on the size of the business and the revenue you generate. Uh, so we're a full service bank and we're here to help all the small businesses succeed financially. Fantastic, and Tom? My name is uh, Tom Becker, and I am a business development officer with uh, Wells Fargo Business Banking. Um, as a large bank, we work with uh, many different types of industries and organizations, and i um, um, excited to be out here today. Thank you very much. 
And then Jim, I'd like you to introduce kind of a little bit about what, you know, yourself and what you do for, for clients as an SBDC advisor. Well, I am a recovering banker of about 30 years. And um, with the SBDC, uh, myself and Wes Paul, who, who is also in the North County, both, both of us were bankers. We're the ones that help many of the businesses prepare a package for the banks uh, and, and Primarily, we're, we're here to help your batting average, to get past, get, get the package ready for a bank so that you're going to have more likelihood of success. Yeah, and that's what's so important. And we're, and we're free. Exactly. And we're free. Exactly. So, um, you know, and, and Jim, why, why do bankers like working with SBDC? Well, the bankers are hopefully are getting better packages. We, you know, we are pre, pre-flighting most of the clients and trying to get them ready with the necessary financial information, cash flow. We will do a lot of the pre-flighting that a bank would have to do on its own. And uh, so when they get a package from us, they know that the package has already been looked over and uh, ideally it is something that they can do and not something that's a waste of time. Fantastic. So, I want to come back to the bankers on, on some other, que- you know, basic core questions in terms of what types of businesses mainly do you work with or not work with? How long do they have to be in business? And even do you work with, with startups? You know, kind of what, uh, you know, what is the wheelhouse for, for you as an institution? Why don't we go ahead and start with, uh, why don't we start with you, Jade? Okay, thank you. So um, I think it would be um, better if I say what we don't work with. So. What we don't work with, of course, you know, the cannabis industry, gambling, um, adult entertainment, you know, those sorts of areas. Um, As far as time in business, um, generally, we like to see two years. You know, I think that's kind of like the the standard across the industry. However, there have been instances where I have been able to lend to a business that is less than two years. Um, you know, a lot of factors go into it, such as um, experience in the industry. You know, if somebody's been in a particular industry for 30 plus years and they've just decided to, you know, start their own business, that is a big impact for us as well. Um, as far as like desirable industries, it's, you know, um, it, it's a different time we're in right now, you know. So, had you have asked me, end of last year, medical, dental, you know, all of the manufacturing, that standard stuff, you know, it's still what we would like to see, you know, I never turn anybody away. I want to get to know the client. I want to know, you know, what their niche in their industry is. So again, like you said, it's a little bit easier to say what we wouldn't work with versus what, you know, I'm not actually targeting a certain industry. It's, um, you know, open to all. So how long do they have to be in business? So, like I said, so two years is the the standard, like industry standard, but I have been able to do some that were less than two years, depending on the the situation of that business. Like I said, experience, um, financial strength, you know, there's a lot of things that can be brought to the table, but standard is two years. Fantastic. All right, Tom, how about you? What what kind of, you know, I think I agree with, with Jade. What's, it's easier to say what you don't work with than what you do work with. Uh, but, you know, again, same sort of thing on time and business and working with startups. Sure, def- definitely. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, as a large bank, we work with many different types of, uh, of industries and organizations. Um, some industries uh, present more risk to lend to, as we may have different credit guidelines for certain industries within our credit policies. Um, we do not currently lend to the cannabis industry, which is, is, is very similar. Um, we, we, do lend to, um, we do lend to startups um, through our SBA lending program. And um, a startup uh, will require an injection of capital from the ownership, a management resume that shows uh, relevant experience to the type of business the client is starting, as well as business plans and projections that really support the request. Um, a startup loan can be more challenging uh, to fund um, as we need to base the decision off uh, financial projections versus the historical cash flow, like we would if we had a business that had, um, you know, um, time in business. So the time in business is is more frequent, um, but we do. Um, and, and as as 
Jade mentioned, you know, the, typically two years is, you know, typically what I see when we start, you know, having those conversations. But as I mentioned, we do lend to startups through our SBA program with within Wells Fargo. We have so many different different programs within within the bank of being a large bank and a large part of my role is helping that client kind of navigate the bank and make sure we're uh, we're introducing the right partners to be able to introduce them. So. So, yeah, and kind of if you when you actually kind of about my sweet spot. Yeah, I mean, we, we, t we tend to, as, as I mentioned, tend to be established businesses that have some historicals that we can, uh, you know, based on historicals versus just basing solely on projections. Fantastic. And Fred, to you, same question. Uh, we specialize in startups. Probably the easiest to say, to say what we don't do, uh, we right now today in today's environment we shy away from the fitness industries uh, restaurants are obviously hard to do right now because of the limited uh, space capabilities in a lot of restaurants but outside of that we're fairly open we do not do business acquisition loans uh, strictly because the program i run for the bank nationally is credit scored and sba will not allow us just to credit score a biz act you have to do traditional underwriting which slows it down so we just stay away from it. Uh, outside of that, probably 90% of the loans that we fund in any given month, and we're funding a little over 10 million a month now with the average loan size of 135,000, 90% of those loans are pure startups, meaning the day that we fund that loan is the day they're opening their doors to, to begin business. So we're not afraid to do a startup. Uh, these are all under the 7A program. We take a lien on the business assets and that's it. Fantastic. And Janelle? Okay, so uh, very similar to everybody else. Uh, we shy away. We have a federal charter, so we're not able to do cannabis, adult entertainment, anything that uh, could be a federally sensitive law, we're not able to do. Um, we, we do ask usually for two years. Again, with uh, less than two years, we look at the, the entire relationship, the entire package. Do they have existing businesses? Do they have any collateral? Um, what kind of experience do they bring? So on a startup, it would have to be a strong candidate and we'd need to look at the entire relationship and be able to show um, some good reason to move forward with a startup, like I said, with collateral or ex experience. Um, for sweet spots, I would say, you know, as a bank, we're collateral lenders. We like to have a business that has a collateral or can mitigate our risk. Uh, so, you know, we like the manufacturing, we like um, doctors and dentists, uh, real estate transactions, anything that we can um, attach a lien to in order to, uh, to you know, lower our risk. Um, so those are, those are the guidelines that we use, but each one is a case by case business uh, basis and we look at the entire relationship. Awesome. And then coming to you, Jim, kind of in, in slight change up, but it, it, you know, really kind of talk about how you as an SBDC business advisor really kind of help clients uh, obtain the funding. So uh, what we primarily do is we review the package that a, a traditional bank would look at and we would organize it such that when we get, when we get ready to, uh, to present it to a bank, normally we would present it to, we would try to present it to the bank where they currently bank. So obviously there is a relationship there and we will start there uh, to see if that bank is interested in banking them. Uh, if not, well then we, we have a collection of bankers, some of which are on here today, and we have probably another 20 or 30 of them that we know. Not all of them are created equal. So like, like you've been hearing, we will identify the ones that might be the best fit and help, and help sort of um, be an be a, a advocate to the bank in your on your behalf at the pre-flight, so that when um, when they talk to you, they already know that, that we've already pre-flighted you, and have the whole package together, so that they're they're not waiting for pieces uh, to, to come together, um, and so you know we know and we will talk. The, the bankers know that we're bankers and we speak banker. Fantastic. I think that is what's important is, is we're, we're able to kind of be that, that bridge and really be that, you know, be able to help folks through that and, and through that entire process. Um, coming back to, to the bankers, you know, obviously we, you know, COVID-19 has uh, 
severely impacted everybody, you know, from the small business community to certainly you as lenders. I'm sure you've had uh, one or two phone calls about that and, uh, and really kind of want to talk a little bit about it. And so, you know, kind of how, you know, how things have changed in terms of, of you looking at it, not, you know, obviously we're, you know, not with the PPP, that's a whole separate conversation and that program ended, we're not getting into that, but just kind of how you're, you know, how you're now looking at, um, you know, at deals and how the small business owner really should be, you know, looking forward to, you know, in terms of obtaining capital, you know, in terms of looking at growing their business um, and, and things like that. So why don't we go ahead and uh, why don't we start this one with Janelle? Okay. Yes, for EdChase, what we do based on the COVID-19 scenario, um, we ask our clients to come to the table. We want to see what they did pre-COVID, where their financials were. We want to see what happened during COVID and how they're doing now. We're looking to see if, what adjustments they've made uh, on their business to stay afloat and to keep continuing their businesses. So we would look for uh, projections um, showing what what they have in place and how they they anticipate their business to go forward. And we would ask them to fill out a questionnaire. We would do a deep dive into, you know, what steps they've taken in place, if they've had to go into reserves, um, if they've kept their staff. So if, if they come to the table, they need to have very specific answers in regards to how they were able to adjust with the COVID um, situation. So those would be the things that we asked for, some just additional information on how they were able to stay, sustain their business during this time. Awesome. And uh, Jade, same question to you. Um, so very similar, you know, um, pre-pandemic, we would ask for, of course, year-end financials and, you know, year-end financials and uh, past financials and that sort of thing. But given that the landscape is ever changing in today's day and age, we are asking for um, more current financials and not necessarily just a balance sheet or a PL. and uh, We are asking for bank statements, which is a little bit of a different um, request. So we're asking for the last three months of bank statements. Um, you know, really, again, learning how the business is sustaining during these times and what they are doing to ensure their success. Um, we have made a few changes, um, little minor changes, you know, pre-pandemic, we were able to do 100,000 unsecured. We have lowered that to 50,000. Um, but there's, you know, um, to kind of piggyback off of what Janelle was saying, you know, if there's collateral that can be offered, whether it's in the form of real estate, equipment, um, a UCC filing used to be something that, you know, was, was a strong offer. It's not as strong as it used to be, but it's still a good thing to add. Uh, or to offer, you know, as collateral. Um, and yeah, just really, you know, really understanding how the business is operating, how their cash flow looks, you know, during these times and what they have in place to get through it. Thank you. Tom, how about for Wells Fargo? Yeah, I mean, very, very similar to what Janelle and Jay just mentioned. I mean, we have um, some separate questions we ask in regards to, uh, to COVID and how it's affected the business, either positively or negatively. Um, really, um, you know, obviously collecting more updated financials. And, you know, really, even pre-COVID, we really need to understand what the, um, the request and understand what the money is going to be used for. And that really hasn't changed. And so, you know, we do get some different requests based on what has happened due to COVID and really just kind of understanding where, you know, we're putting the right, um, right lending in place for that client. So, Fantastic. And Fred, what about you all? Yeah, I mean, given the fact that most of ours are, are pure startups, uh, we're going off of projections, but part of that, those projections now, we've got a questionnaire where they've got to address the COVID issues, uh, the same as if an existing business was uh, that would have to do. Um, you know, what effects is that going to have on your cash flow and your ability to generate that cash flow going forward? Um, ours is a credit scored program, so we use the Fair Isaac small business scoring model. It's the same model that SBA now uses and behind us, uh, but I've been using that model since 2003. So we can approve initial credit the same day we get the simple loan application in. From there, it's a matter of dotting I's and crossing T's for SBA. The only difference we've done recently is increased our backside liquidity requirements. Um, we want to see post-closing liquidity of a minimum of $50,000. 
and that could include IRAs, 401ks, even though they're not technically liquid assets, we view them as though they are because it's fallback that the borrower has. And that's on these small loans up to 150,000. Fantastic. You know, because I, I know that has certainly changed things and I'm glad you brought it up in terms of projections and that's something, you know, certainly the SVDC helps with, but also helps folks understand what they need to do to kind of cross that. And so kind of in, uh, in understanding some of these things, you know, so Jim, can you kind of help um, help our audience, you know, and kind of how you do it with defining what a debt service coverage ratio is and uh, what cash flow means exactly and why that's important in loan approval that uh, certainly they were talking about. And same thing with projections that, uh, that they're talking about. Yeah, so the, ca you know, cash flow coverage ratio is the, probably the most important. That's the ability to show the bank that you can repay the loan. Uh, that, you know, that's, that's cash flow. That's the true cash flow from your business. Uh, it takes into consideration in some cases accounts receivable, accounts payable, and so forth. But the, the very simple methodology for this is really your net profit plus any depreciation plus any interest less any kind of distributions that you make. That's the, that's the number that basically is going to service the debt for the, for the bank. And um, they want to see that, it, that it's positive. They want to see that in most cases, maybe the lenders here will talk about it, what the ratios need to be. But my experience is, is that normally it's at least 125 or better. They want some buffer between, they don't want one to one. So they don't want to know that you're just barely making it. They want some leverage. They want some coverage above one to one, just in case you hit any, hit any speed bumps. So, um, it's, this is the number one. This is the number one thing for most for most banks. I would say collaterals next, um, and so you know as you've heard from some of these bankers, you know collateral becomes important in various things. Uh, I think the other thing that you have to realize is that in many cases there's a personal guarantee required, so that you as a person will need to guarantee that loan. Uh, a lot of people over the years have said, why do you need a personal guarantee? It's sort of like you're putting your your name on the line. You're putting you're putting your 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 interest there, and if you're not willing to do that, the bank's a little less willing to uh, to do to uh, to lend to you. If if you're not willing to put your personal side up for 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 review and for coverage. No, oh, that's a, that's absolutely correct. I think that's something I saw all of our lenders nodding as you were describing the personal <laughs> guarantee. So <laughs> I'm sure that's a conversation they've had uh, recently and frequently. Um, so I do know that that's something that's that's really important. So um, you know, to come back to the lenders, I, you know, let's let's do talk a teeny bit about some of the disaster situations. I know you know there was a lot to, going on with with PPP loans and and all of that, and you know, kind of talk about the your experience as a lender with, uh, with, you know, if you did handle PPP or kind of how you've been handling some of the disaster situations with it. And, uh, you know, in, in you know, also in a little bit in terms of the, the go forward. And uh, why don't we start with you, Tom? I know Wells Fargo, uh, you know, did one or two PPP loans. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, for, for sure. <laughs> we were, yes, we were very active in the, in the PPP program um, through, through, through Wells Fargo. Um, and, uh, that, that was very active in that program. We did refer out some other, you know, there were other, obviously other lending programs out there um, that were available as well. And that you know, we worked very closely with the SBDC on um, for, for clients that were looking to, for some other disaster um, type loans um, through the program. So, um, and then um, what was the second part of the question? Dan? Well, well, just kind of what, you know, in addition to PPP, you know, what, you know, how are you kind of looking at, you know, how's the disaster impacting, you know, what, you know, your business models and kind of what you, how you're functioning. You know, we've made some changes to some of our credit policies on dirt on, on certain things, but really it kind of comes down to we're still very actively lending. It's just really um, making sure that we understand, as we kind of talked about in the last question, how that business was impacted either positively or negatively by COVID, what the numbers look like right now. I mean, if there were a business that was impacted and had to close for maybe part of March, part of, uh, part of April and May, um, you know, what does it look like? Have they rebounded to pre-COVID numbers in June and July, or are they still kind of building back up to that point? So it's just really understanding um, what the money um, they're looking for, what the request, how they're going to be using that money and just really understanding that. Fantastic. And uh, what about you, Jade? How, how did Banner Bank kind of get through this? 
So we definitely participated in the program. Um, we actually pulled over 200 employees to create a PPP team that was strictly dedicated to this process. And, uh, you know, we did over, we were able to get over, um, I think it was over 9,000 businesses funded, over 1 billion lent out. So we definitely were very prominent in the process. Um, and, you know, it's, you know, just as what the PPP was intended for is just working with these businesses to, you know, help them stay afloat. Um, and so as far as, and I'm sorry, the second part of the question was additional disaster relief. Was that? Just if you've done any additional disaster relief and then also kind of how you've, you know, changed a little bit of the business model, if at all. Right. Um, so as far as additional disaster relief, you know, um, specifically to products, the PPP was our main focus. Um, as far as, you know, like, like I said before, as far as adjusting our model to help businesses during this time, um, we added additional, you know, requirements that would show their strengths, like the bank statements, you know, and that sort of thing. And um, just really diving into the needs to find out how we can help that perhaps we weren't able to do before, you know. Um, last year, if a business had come to me for a small, you know, cash flow line of credit, a uh, collateral would be an after conversation, you know, a conversation we would have after diving into the financials and all of that. So um, there, I know there were uh, quite a few banks out there, for example, that uh, on the consumer side stops lending as far as like home equity lines of credit and that sort of thing goes. We have not ceased lending on either side, the business or the consumer. Like I said, just on the business side, we just are asking for some additional information so that we can get a better picture of where the business is today. Fantastic. And Fred, United Midwest, they certainly, you know, obviously being focused on startups, you know, did, did you all handle PPP or, and if not, kind of how you, you know, what disasters work have you done? Now, uh, we did do PPP, uh, but we uh, limited it to it, our, strictly our customer base so that we knew the, uh, the people we were dealing with. Uh, we, you know, for the whole month of, of the latter part of March and, 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 the, and the whole month of April, we were concentrated in uh, turning PPP loans, and then we pivoted back. Once we got all that dispersed out, we pivoted back to our regular 7A portfolio. We're strictly an SBA 7A lender. Uh, we don't offer conventional financing. So everything we do is geared to that 7A loan, protecting that guarantee. Uh, Great. And again, you know, the PPP was, you know, really did utilize that 7A model. And that, that was that. Absolutely. Yeah. And the beauty of the, the part of the CARES Act is that uh, our existing portfolio, their payments for the next six months were made by SBA and that's effective through September. And then any loans that we're funding now, their first six months of payments are made by the SBA uh, under that CARES Act. So that's really helped uh, from a portfolio standpoint right now. What's gonna be interesting is what happens to everybody's portfolios after September. Exactly. But I think that point remain, you know, is, is, is worthy of emphasis. So if you still get a SBA 7A loan before the end of September, the SBA does what, Fred? <laughs> First six monthly payments. <laughs> That's a big deal. <laughs> Very big deal. That's part of the reason my pipeline's gone ballistic. <laughs> Yeah, and if I, you don't mind me jumping in, that was okay. one thing I forgot to mention was we did do the payment deferrals as well, both on our SBA, SBA side of the lending as well as um, conventional. We were able to offer some payment relief with that. So that seemed to be well received as well. Fantastic. Then we'll come to you, Janelle. I, I, I know Chase did one or two PPP loans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one or, one or, one or 300,000 PPP loans. <laughs> I think we were the leader in the PPP loan. Um, I, and I think if you look at the numbers, you know, 75% were to small businesses. So we really were involved in getting out to our small business owners um, with less than 150,000 um, requests. So we, you know, we worked pretty much around the clock getting uh, PPP loans done. Um, I think we ended up doing like almost 23 billion in PPP loans. Um, when we finished up, at first we just offered it to our clients. Um, the second round, because of the additional money, we did open it up to non-clients. Um, we just asked that you had a checking account with us for 10 business days. So we were really instrumental in, in getting out to our clients. Um, through our website, chase.com um, backslash cares, we do have 
um, information about, you know, everything that Chase is offering as well as the SBA and the Treasury. So we are talking to our clients about the EIDL loans, um, the EIDG, the grants. Um, we're also talking about the Main Street lending programs as well. I'm telling them to reach out to the communities. Each community does have um, some sort of grants and, and um, available to their business owners. Uh, the other thing that we are doing is working with our clients. Um, we are setting up loan deferrals, um, you know, again, for, through the SBA's, you know, program, the six months, as well as um, any traditional loan. We are giving loan deferrals um, three months. Um, we can do an additional three months if you do show financial hardship. So Chase is really reaching out to um, all of our clients and our business clients to, to make sure they're aware of any and all um, opportunities available to them. Um, we want to make sure that everyone makes it through this, you know, really, you know, interesting, stressful, hard time, you know, for, for everyone. Absolutely. And, you know, banks have been critical partners and we've worked with a ton of them. Um, and, and so, Jim, I just, you know, I, I know it wasn't one of the questions Lynn emailed you, but wanted just to kind of, you know, what has been your experience as an SBDC advisor helping folks get, get in particular the PPP loans and other disaster loans uh, during these times? Well, we've had a, a number of customers who, uh, you know, needed to, the PPP or the idle loans, and we would walk them through the, the application process, the, the how to calculate it. Sometimes they didn't have the necessary information that they needed to figure out, or that the uh, the, the uh, lender that they might be going to might not be asking the questions about some of the things. Uh, such as health benefits and retirement benefits, things like that, to add to those. Uh, so, you know, we, we helped uh, at, at the height of this. I think we were helping, I was helping uh, eight to 10 people a day uh, on the PPP idle. Uh, now we've, of course, shifted to the PPP forgiveness. We're helping people with the PPP forgiveness and trying to help them get ready for those of you at, at Wells and, and Bank of America and Chase and everybody else that when you will open up your portals, I guess, to look to look towards uh, the forgiveness applications. So we're helping them get ready for that. Uh, we also helped a number of customers with the County of San Diego loan grant program uh, and the various cities around, you know, a lot of some of the cities still are uh, uh, granting funds. Uh, uh, we have uh, Encinitas and we have Oceanside and Escondido and so forth. And number of these other cities around are granting. So we're directing those people to try to help them. Uh, and then on the, on the traditional loan stuff, you know, I, one of our stories I had was recently you had a client that was turned down by a number of banks, couldn't understand why he was turned down. And we walked him through that his financial statements was miss, was missing a, por a portion of the revenue uh, in his in, in his accounting, he was said he was accrual basis accounting, but he was more likely cash basis accounting. So he had forgot about he was an auto body shop. He had forgot about the 20 cars sitting out there in his in his facility that he had not billed for, and yet had worked on all of those cars and bought products and so forth. And um, he was able to get a loan to to refinance his building. Uh, even though he'd been turned down at three different banks, including the bank that had the, the existing loan. That's fantastic. So, you know, again, we've helped literally thousands and thousands of businesses through this time and, and really helped them navigate it because there's oftentimes, you know, kind of the deep dive into, into your financials and understanding everything. And that's really what, what we're here to do. Um, so kind of pivoting a little bit back to just kind of the, the traditional types of lending and things that are going on, you know, really on the basis, which basics, which is, you know, the application process itself. So, you know, what is kind of the, the application process with your, uh, you know, with you a, a, as a bank? And then, you know, how long does it take to complete what the underwriting, you know, with the underwriting decision and really kind of, you know, assuming again, you have all the documents in place. How long does it take to fund a loan from start to finish? So why don't we go ahead and uh, let, let's start with Tom. Yeah, I mean, really, our the, the timeline really kind of depends on the uh, depends on the type of loan. Um, you know, so something like a credit card or a, a small line of credit under $100,000, we usually have a decision in about, you know, within two to three days, if not sooner. Um, anytime we get over a $100,000 request, then we're collecting a much more full financial package. 
and um, and and it also depends on the request of how long it will take. Um, you know, um, usually somewhere around 60 to 90 days to fund um, after um, yeah, at this point. Uh, based on the based on the type of request they're looking for, um, some will be a little bit quicker based on it. Um, but um, you know, especially if it's a if it's a purchase of a building, um, and we're on a timeline, we, that one might may be a little bit quicker. But if it's more of a business acquisition or a business startup, we're probably looking at more of that 60 to 90 days from the time we collect the full the full package um, on that point. And Fred, you have been touching on this throughout, but you know, maybe if you can just outline it in a you know in a straightforward you know you know as well the, the process for you all. It, it all starts with the loan application. We have a simple, uh, if you've got a one owner business, it's three pages. Uh, the first two pages are about the business. Uh, page two is really nothing more than a, uh, a listing of the officers, directors, and the ownership breakout. Uh, and then a principal information page. Uh, that comes into our office here in Panama City. It's loaded into a platform so that we can pull credit and score it through the small business model. Uh, if we approve it, then we assign it to a packager who will email that borrower and copy the SBDC, um, a checklist of everything we're going to need to move it on down the assembly line, so to speak. Uh, and from there, it's, a, you know, the borrower kind of drives initially the boat, so to speak. The quicker they get things back to, a, to us, the quicker we can review it and move it on into underwriting and then from underwriting to closing. In normal times, I would tell you that if we're not funding even a startup in 30 days or less, where something's amiss. Uh, but with the way the pipeline has blossomed, uh, that's just not uh, happening right now today. And I understand that. I, we've hired, we're hiring people as fast and training as fast as we can. But uh, it's probably more like 60 days now from start to, to finish. Fantastic. What about you, Janelle? Uh, I would say a uh, very similar, uh, the smaller loans, you know, an unsecured line of credit, uh, less than 250, we could probably do in a matter of, you know, days or weeks, um, something more complex, you know, and there's underwriting um, could take up to 60 days. Uh, but what my process is, is when I start talking to the clients, you know, we, we've mentioned the word pre-flight. What we do is we take a look at the tax returns. We look at take a look at the financials. Um, so we we do a pre-flight when we first start talking to the client to really understand the business. So that we try to you know streamline the process and we we have everything in place so that when we start the actual application process, it goes seamlessly. So we do spend a lot of time reviewing documentation, um, financials, making sure that they have everything in place. Uh, and again, you know, real estate. Could take 60 days, 90 days, but again, if it's a, if it's a purchase, you know, we work with getting everything done so that you, you know, that you can get done as quickly as possible. Uh, and the main issue that I find for the length of time would be the package. And I know that you've mentioned SBDC helps getting the package together. If you have a complete clean package, that means the world. It means that we're able to look at the package, we're able to look at the financials, we're able to look at the the personal financial statement and see and get a clear understanding of the business. And that, you know, takes days and weeks off a loan request by having a complete, clean, thorough documented package. And I can't stress how important that is. Fantastic. And, and to you, Jade. Okay. So um, as far as the application process goes, you know, I definitely, when I'm meeting with my clients, I want, I want to make sure that I am, like everyone said, obtaining the full financial package. I won't submit anything to underwriting that is not complete. And the reason being is because once I do submit that complete package to underwriting, I typically have a decision within one to two days. Um, of course, dependent on you know the type of lending we're doing, um, the things that can take the most time, of course, um, for example, real estate, we're at the mercy of a third party appraiser, right? So we're waiting for the appraisal to come back on the property. Um, I will say that my most recent um, owner occupied piece of real estate that I did from application to dock closing was three and a half weeks. So it is one positive thing of the pandemic is that, you know, we're accepting drive by appraisals as opposed to having to schedule a full appraisal that requires the appraiser to go inside the property. So that has been a benefit, you know, of today's day and age. 
um, you know, as far as the smaller, you know, if we're doing like a $50,000 line of credit that from application to doc closing, if all goes well, could be a matter of days as well. So of course it does depend on the product as well as the size. Um, if, you know, with the size though, it, you know, for the larger loans, I'm still, we're still collecting, like I said, we're still collecting that complete package up front. So I, nothing is getting submitted to underwriting that is not complete, which would delay anything as far as that side of the house goes. So um, yes, a complete package is definitely important. Um, I would suggest for business owners to have, you know, financials ready, such as the balance sheet, P&L, um, both year, uh, year end, you know, last two years um, of financials as year end, also year to date. Year to date is very important in, you know, like I said, today's environment. Um, I think, did I miss anything? I think I'm good. <laughs> Fantastic. And then we're actually going to stay with you, Jade. We'll start with you on the on kind of on the next question, because again, you've kind of talked about some of the details, but maybe given a, you know, an example on, on helping a business, maybe kind of in a unique deal or something kind of funky on helping them obtain a loan. And, um, you know, and if you've also worked with an SBDC advisor, um, you know, or, you know, with the SBDC on, on that, you know, use that as well as an, as an example, or if, if, you know, if not just some of the success cases you've already had. Yeah, sure. Um, so I, and I know I realize this will need to change, but I have not worked directly with an SBDC advisor yet. Um, so that is definitely in my future. Um, but as far as, you know, an example of a recent loan, um, so uh, as I meant, so my, my sweet spot, what I enjoy the most is I really love helping businesses obviously grow, right, but also get into properties. So my most recent deal was owner-occupied real estate that typically would not really be in our wheelhouse. And what I did was, you know, met with the owner, of course, and really got to know him as a human, right? Of course, the financials and all of that, that's what makes or breaks a deal, but the relationship is also very important, you know? So understanding his impact in the community, understanding his experience, um, in the industry, you know, where he sees himself, you know, 5, 10, 15 years from now, and really getting to know, like I said, the human, right? Um, and that's what I mean by the human aspect is, I think so often it is forgotten that money is personal, right? Business is personal, and it's really important to get to know that side of the business. So in this particular case, it was um, the first purchase of property, it wouldn't have necessarily been the strongest deal, but we were able to get it done because of, again, community impact. Financials were strong. So of course, you know, that led to the ultimate decision. But just, again, just really getting to know the, you know, the, the picture outside of the financials. Um, a recent one that was declined, um, simply just no collateral was offered. And it was a larger request, of course, it was over 200,000, but we, collateral is very important in today's day and age. So that, um, that was one of the recent declines. Thank you. Same question to you, Fred. Uh, that's a prime example is today. We funded 10 loans. We're funding in the process of wiring out 10 loans today. And it, it runs the, the spectrum. Uh, uh, cleaning, ser home cleaning services, medical billing, uh, home organization systems, concrete installation, painting, uh, residential and commercial, senior home care, property damage restoration, digital marketing. So you, you know, you name it. We're, we're doing all over the spectrum. Uh, a lot, a, a good portion of what we do are franchises. Uh, and we're uh, hooked up with some some very good franchise brokers, but we also do a lot of business with the SBDCs on a nationwide basis, and we get referrals in from the SBDCs as well as other bankers. Because once other bankers recognize that we're not, we don't offer checking accounts or credit cards or the typical banking services. In a lot of cases, we can be their best friend because we'll do a lot of things they don't want to do, and they get to maintain that relationship. So uh, it's it's a a broad spectrum of what we what we do do in today's environment. Fantastic. And then coming to you, Tom. Great. Um, 
One, one example that I'm really proud of was an example that um, last year I was referred through uh, one of the SBDC advisors, a, a client. It was a few million dollar business and the client um, um, had started the business in 2001. They ran into a, um, a challenge in about 2008 where they had a, you know, a fairly large uh, credit issue that um, caused some issues for the business. And so they'd been a unable to secure traditional bank credit. Um, so the, this business advisor and myself, we met with the client at, first of all at the SBDC office, and then it kind of moved on where I went out to the customer's site. It was a, a franchise service business. I went out to the customer's office, met with them, really got to know the client, really got to understand the business and where they'd been, where they were going. Um, really, it was, a, it was a great, great meeting. And um, from, that, from that meeting, um, you know, it was great because working alongside the SBDC advisor, they had really prepared a lot of the information going into it as well. So it was really kind of a, a really good partnership. Um, so what, what we were able to do is we were able to help the client secure some traditional credit um, back at the end of, uh, end of 2019. And, um, it, and it's kind of evolved from there where we started to do more for that client. And we even had conversations recently about trying to up the, up the limit they had. And it was just really a great story about working together with the SBDC. And then at the same time is really helping a client who had had some challenges, but just by working with all of us together, we were able to really help them out. So, um, so that, that's a story I'm kind of proud of from, from, from that standpoint um, of with helping a credit a client who had some challenges secure credit and really start to rebuild. Um, on the on the flip side, um, um, you know, I mean, we run across different things. I mean, you know, obviously, um, a deal that I recently had to um, um, decline was a, was a client who unfortunately had been showing losses on their tax returns for the last couple of years. They were pretty leveraged on some uh, some credit card debt um, and some other high interest debt, and they really were looking to secure more credit. And unfortunately, just based on even after having a lot of you know conversations, we just weren't able to um, extend that uh, the credit through us. But we were able to refer them out to somebody else to really try to to try to help them, maybe a, a non traditional lender to try to help them in a different situation. But it, unfortunately, it just wasn't a fit. But at this point for us, but uh, down the road, we're hoping it'll it'll turn into something down the road to be able to help them after they clean some stuff up. So, thanks, Tom. And and finishing up with you, Janelle. Uh, yes. This for example of a loan that was approved, uh, just one I'm, I'm working on right now, it's an actual uh, restaurant, um, which you know is a challenge right now, uh, as well as uh, they're looking to do some construction. So we were able to meet, I mean, I brought a team of partners within Chase. We, we looked at all the different angles that we could you know, go forward with on the loan to make it successful. We looked at you know, personal side, business side, collateral, um, but we were able to to find uh, a program through SBA that that worked for him. We were able to get him qualified based on his ability to, you know, actually grow his business during uh, this time. He was able to, you know, he has a drive through, so his business was booming. He was able to show profit. Um, he's he's taken all the right steps, and so we we're able to, you know, in the write up show that not only um, has he been able to you know, continue doing the COVID-19 um, situation, he's been able to, to grow and expand. So uh, we were able to, to get that going and get that approved for him. So it was a success just because if, you know, as a banker, if you talk restaurant and construction during this time period, you know, it's usually a no, but we were able to find, you know, the right, um, right way to do it and work with him and, and get him what he, he needs. And he's able to continue employing. He's going to actually employ more people and bring more people on board. So, you know, we're really proud of that, that not only we were able to help him expand his business, but able to bring some more jobs to the community. So that was, that was a great win. Um, for a decline, um, most of my declines are because of loss. You know, they have, you have a loss situation on your tax returns. Um, I, had, I had two lines of credit just recently that were declined. Um, one was because there was a loss on the, the, um, the tax returns. I was able to refer them out to an external partner to the CDC, and they're able to do it based on projections. So I was able to work within the partnerships that I've made through the SBDC. Uh, the other one was a line of credit. We weren't able to show, uh, again, he had a lo loss on his tax returns, but in talking to what he wanted, he was just looking for a purchase of some, you know, computer equipment. It was going to be about eighty thousand dollars. And so, what we did is we did it as a credit card. He was able to get zero percent interest, get the rewards points, and we it was based 
you know, solely on credit, not on his tax returns. So both situations, even though there was a decline, I was able to, you know, mitigate the decline and work around it to get him to the right person, the right product, you know, to get them what they need. Fantastic. So before we get to the last question, we had a good one question. I know a couple of you have mentioned, I'll just open it up to anybody where, you know, is anyone, you know, what are you doing with the, the main street lending program or the, you know, the, the, through the federal reserve, if anything, and uh, you know, and what clients should do or businesses should do that might be interested in learning more about it or potentially applying for that program. Anyone working on that? I'll just leave it up to any of you four. Uh, Chase is active in the main street lending program. Uh, it is a, a credit-based product, so it does have um, some financial and credit requirements. Um, the minimum is two hundred fifty thousand. Uh, but if you reach out to, you know, your banker or to me, uh, Chase, we can I can give you more specific information. Uh, but we do are we are active in doing the Main Street Lending Program. Awesome. Anyone else? Yes, we're, we're also involved in the Main Street Lending Program. There's, uh, if, you, if you go to our website, there's a link that gives information about the Main Street Lending Program through Wells Fargo. Um, and also, um, if, if you, you do have, uh, you can also talk to your Wells Fargo banker in regards to that as well um, from our Main Street Lending Program. Fantastic. Then we'll kind of, we'll come back to kind of the, the last question here. And we're actually going to start here with Jim in terms of, you know, what are two tips you can give to uh, small business owners to be successful? Well, actually, I have three of them. Sorry for the three. That's good. Um, uh, well, the first one, of course, would be to start with the SBDC. The SBDC can help you with projections, as you've heard, there's necessary for some places, uh, help you with the packaging, business plans, all the various things that can help your business be successful. So um, even if you're not looking for money necessarily, we can help you be, just be successful so that when you do need money, uh, you're ready to go. Um, well, the second tip I would say to people would be stay away from the payday lenders, the, 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 payday, the payday business lenders. They are just uh, a lot of banks. I don't know if the bankers will tell us that, but a lot of places won't even touch you if you have some payday lending uh, out there uh, because it's just such an anchor around your neck. The last thing is, I think most of the bankers will agree, quality, you've heard here, quality financial statements. Imagine driving your car without a dashboard. So I tell people, you didn't have anything, you don't have any dashes, any, any controls, anything on your car. How would you do driving it? Running your company without good quality financial statements is the key. Fantastic. Now, what about you, Jade? What, what are a couple of tips you could, would give? I would say just be transparent. You know, I mean, as soon as we run credit and we, you know, we do the cash flow and all that, we're going to see all of the financials as far as the business goes. So be transparent. Um, definitely, you know, let your banker know what your plan is, not just right now for obtaining that lending. We want to know, you know, I, I want to grow with you. So I hope to still be in your life, you know, as far as five, 10 years down the line. So I want to know where your business is going hopes, dreams, and where you want to take it. And um, yeah, just be transparent, um, be ready for, you know, us to ask for the financials to, you know, ask for everything except a blood sample, basically, <laughs> you know, so just be transparent and just realize that we are here to help you as a human with your business. Fantastic. What about you, Fred? Uh, yeah, be truthful on the front side. Tell us, tell us the true story. Um, when we ask for household income, uh, tell us what you tell Uncle Sam you make, uh, because trust me, we're going to verify all of that. Uh, we'll get tax transcripts uh, to verify your personal income. Um, but we're going to get tax transcripts to, if you're an existing business to verify your business income. So be truthful with us on the front side. If you've got an issue, tell us about it. Let's work through it. On the, It's a lot easier to solve issues when I know about it on the front side as opposed to we get to the closing table and find something that stops everything. Thank you. What about you, Janelle? What are a couple of tips? I would say, uh, I agree with everything that's been said before, but I would also add, know what you want. I mean, don't, don't expect, you know, your banker or your loan officer to, to help you to determine how much money you need for your business. You know, I don't know. You should know this is your business. So you should have a clear idea when you're talking to a banker, 
This is what I'm making. This is what I need. This is why I need it. So a, a clear understanding of what you want and why you need it. And it'll help us tell the story because we have to tell the story to the underwriter. Like what's the purpose of the loan? Why did they need the money? And if you're not, if you don't give us good solid information, it's hard for us to advocate for you and, and to pitch the loan for you. Um, and then I agree with, you know, transparency and honesty because it's the worst thing is to find out that there's something that, that shows up on the credit that they didn't tell us about. Because if it is, if you tell me about it, then I can tell that story to the underwriter. You know, 2008, everyone had a bad year. You know, this is what happened. You know, so I was able to, to understand and explain it to the underwriter. And it goes to character too, because if you're hiding something from us, if we find it, then we're, then the question starts arising. It's like dating somebody, right? Well, what else haven't you told me? What else do I need to find out if there's this issue already? So yes, just be transparent and know exactly what you want and how much you need and why you need it. Fantastic. We'll wrap up with you, Tom, a couple of quick tips. Yeah, I mean, very similar to what everyone else said. The biggest thing is that I'm, I'm here to, to advocate. Um, so really being able to articulate how you're going to use the money is really the most important. And if you are trying to work through that, we're happy to work through it. But, um, you know, an SBDC advisor is a really good uh, sounding board to kind of help you. And if you know you need, you, you're looking for financing, but kind of want to break down how you're going to use that money, um, it's great when you can work with an SBDC advisor. And I'm also here to, to, to help walk through it, but really know what the, what, what you're, the money's going to be used for. Um, and then the second part is just the organization. I mean, as we kind of talked about earlier today, just the ability to be organized is going to make it a lot easier to, um, you know, to be able to, um, you know, and by working with an SBDC advisor, they're going to help you get it organized. And then we have a better, a better likelihood to be able to get um, the request uh, taken care of for you. Fantastic. And again, I really appreciate, uh, you know, you, Janelle, Jay, Tom, Fred, and of course, Jim, one of our SBDC advisors, as a reminder, as, as everyone's been talking about, we're here, we're a free service, um, where it's funded by the, uh, the Small Business Administration and the, and the state of California, and we're here to help you kind of navigate through this process, be a sounding board, help you get everything organized, and, uh, and, and all of our services are also completely confidential. So as you're being transparent with us, we keep that in confidence as well. So again, this is our Connecting with Capital series. We really appreciate this. This is our, our first week of this month. Um, next week, we would have our nonprofit lenders, such as CDC Small Business Finance that Janelle mentioned. And uh, the, the last week of the month, the last Friday of the month is when we have some alternative lenders as well. And we, we appreciate everyone kind of being able to kind of learn about lending, talk about lending. And again, thanks to our sponsors, Home Street Bank, CDC Small Business Finance, Marble Bridge Funding, and Primary Funding. And a special thanks to, to our four panelists today and to Jim, our, our, our SBDC advisor. And so we really appreciate it. And, and we hope you all have a fantastic day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.